Silicon Flatirons is a research center at Colorado Law School. We work with students to give them the tools they need to pursue careers in tech, law, policy, and entrepreneurship. When I started, Silicon Flatirons was an experiment. It was me and some students putting on a few conferences without really a plan where it was gonna go. My initial motivation was because I didn't believe you could have impactful policy discussions unless you brought people together across different disciplines. Silicon Flatiron Center has given me an image of what a team can look like. And it really made Boulder into a location that was seen as on par with DC or Silicon Valley and other places around the country that are leading thought centers in the field of law and tech. What's excited me uh, the most is to see it grow, but not only just grow in terms of the number of people attending our different events, but growing in terms of the different areas that we have been involved in. When a law student says, I've got a passion for understanding the intersection of technology and law, but where do I get started with that? What Flatirons provides is addition to actually go angle for a job during their second summer, where they're actually gonna to get to be involved directly in setting tech policy or in advocating around tech policy. The Silicon Flatirons community is incredibly unique in how close it is and how people are willing to band together to move conversations forward. It's one thing to be sitting in a room by yourself reading articles, and it's very much another thing to actually be sitting at a table talking to somebody about their daily experiences of trying to navigate compliance with a complex new law. We're all a community of uh, friends who enjoy spending time with one another. The people we engage with through here are very much thinkers and thought leaders, so they're contributing to whether it's our strategy or our resources in really meaningful ways. Uh, Silicon Flatirons has changed the dynamic between Colorado law and the surrounding community as well as the national community. One of the great joys of my profession is talking to people who are really early in their careers and helping them get excited about what you're excited about. We get the types of people in the room that everyone thinks should be talking to one another, but often are not. I get to work with students, I get to work with attorneys, I get to work with policymakers at the intersection of all these issues. Students are first and foremost, so uh, everything is generally student-driven. And it is centered around people who are wanting to engage with students. I've seen students uh, come into Silicon Flatirons just having a little interest in it, you know, in year one, and by year three, uh, they're passionate about it and they found their career. And I think that that really helps the um, standing of the university more broadly and it also attracts lots of really interesting and talented speakers. I think what I'm excited to see happen with Silicon Flatirons in the next five, ten, even twenty years is for it to blend continuity with change. It's not enough to have smaller conversations anymore. The world is all connected, and Silicon Flatirons is going to reflect that global nature of the internet as we move forward into 20 years in the future. I hope it continues to operate with the same spirit of experimentation, of adventure, of seeking out new challenges that we've done over the first 20 years. Well, welcome all of you back to part two of the conference. Uh, delighted to welcome our, our panelists who I'm going to introduce here momentarily. Just to give you some sense about where we are going, we're going to do this in four parts. First is we're going to talk about past disruptions to the labor force and what we might learn from those historical disruptions as it relates to the movement into AI and machine learning. Second, we'll identify other changes that are relevant to the workforce and employment landscape as AI and machine learning gets more important. Third, we will explore policy, me policy measures. That is what responses by policymakers may be appropriate and what other measures might be a role for private industry. 
And then fourth, we'll open it up for questions somewhere around 11.30, 11.35, and we'll complete uh, this session at about 11.50. So that is where we are going. Um, I will ask my co-panelists if there's any moment in which my audio goes out, please start waving your hands and grab my attention, and we will audible as appropriate. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm going to introduce each of the panelists. I will direct you to their online bios for more full information, but I've asked each of them as part of introduction to say a word about their vantage point, where they're coming from for this discussion, as well as tease one point that they plan to go deeper on as our panel goes forward. Maybe I'll introduce Jason Albert first, who is the Managing Director of Public Policy at Workday. Jason, welcome. Great to have you on the panel. Thanks so much, Brad. Uh, my name is Jason Albert. Uh, I'm Managing Director of Public Policy at Workday. Uh, Workday is a uh, leading provider of human capital management, financial management, uh, planning and analytics services. So think of us as a, a cloud-based provider. Uh, anytime you interact with a, an HR system, uh, we provide that. We provide uh, things that a CFO needs to, to manage the books of the company and to plan and to analyze data. Uh, so we come at this issue uh, really from the perspective of both helping our customers uh, adjust to the new world of work, adjust to a world where AI and ML are changing work, and also in the integration of AI and ML into our products to help uh, to help our customers. Uh, and so uh, excited to be here uh, and, and particularly excited to talk about uh, from our perspective that even as AI and ML transform the workforce, they provide the tools that enable companies and workers to navigate that transformation. Thank you, Jason. Uh, next, we'll introduce James Besson, who is the Executive Director of the Technology and Policy Research Initiative at Boston University School of Law. James, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so we do uh, empirical-based research on the impacts of technology on society. Uh, we draw on a wide variety of data, uh, of, of evidence, uh, historical data, uh, surveys of AI startups, um, and micro data from government agencies and the like in, in terms of being able to uh, divine what the actual impacts are of automation on workers. Um, the, the point I'll thrust out here as a teaser is I think a lot of people focus on the wrong issue. A lot of people are very concerned that automation is going to eliminate jobs on a massive scale. And I think for a variety of reasons, that's not the real challenge. Uh, there are jobs being destroyed, but there are also jobs being created, and that's going to continue for the next several decades. The real issue, though, is that when jobs get destroyed and other jobs created, people have to make transitions from one job to another. So it's uh, often causing them to have spells of unemployment, uh, but also they need to gain new skills. They need to often switch occupations, industries, in many cases relocate. And those are uh, heavy burdens on many people and our social safety net isn't up to the task of really addressing that. Uh, James, I wanna thank you for what passes as a massive burst of optimism in these times in terms of uh, <laughs> even though there's gonna be disruption, well, there will be job I, creation, which I think you're right. Uh, and uh, we'll come yeah, I, it's not an entirely optimistic, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of pain involved, uh, you know, so I, 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 I don't classify myself as, as an unbridled optimist, but I, I think the real, you know, the, the mistake people are making is focusing on the wrong issue. We're not going to, we're not going to solve the real problem that we're facing if we're worried about some kind of massive unemployment. I, I don't think that's likely. We're going to face a very serious and increasingly serious problem. Um, but it's a different problem, and we need to we need to really uh, focus on that. Uh, you know, in many ways, the, the the history is interesting because the 19th century had a also had a tremendous transition. They they experienced tremendous automation uh, and a, and a wrenching change from living on a farm to living in cities and working in factories. Um, it took them a, a very long time, many decades, to really figure out uh, how to adjust. Um, it, it, and again, it wasn't that automation. Uh, created mass unemployment. It didn't then. It created new jobs, um, but it, it, it was a very wrenching transition. And, you know, if, if you look at, at what happened in Europe in 1848 and, 
there was there was certainly a lot of disruption and social unrest related to the transition. Great. We're going to circle back to that here shortly. Thanks for teeing sure. that. I want to introduce uh, Elizabeth Carla Forsyth, who's an assistant professor at the School of Labor and Employment Relations at the University of Illinois. Thank you for beaming in, Elizabeth. Great. Well, thanks a lot for including me on this panel. Um, I also just wanted to thank the panelists in the first session, which I thought was really fascinating and really informative. Um, so I'm a labor economist, and what I study is how technology changes the tasks that are performed in jobs, but I also look at sort of what are the impacts on the broader labor market. And I'm going to talk later about my research about computerization of office support jobs, but one thing that I want to emphasize is that we actually find that computerization increased the total number of, um, of jobs in the, in the uh, economy. And so this actually is consistent with what James is saying in terms of, you know, that actually it's going to really depend on the technology and we don't necessarily know what's happening. You know, we, we can't predict the future, but if we look at the past technological change, there's no reason to think that the rise of AI and machine learning is going to lead to these sort of, you know, massive loss of jobs and a massive change in the economy in terms of, you know, fewer people employed and, and more unemployment. But I do want to emphasize that you know, when I looked in what's happening with these changing office support jobs and sort of the broader uh, spillover effects from that, we do see really uneven effects depending on workers' skill levels. So there's people that are really losing out, and those are the people that have fewer skills, less education, you know, office support jobs that workers that don't have the skills to keep up with computerization, those are the people that are really suffering, right? And those are the people that have less employment and lower wages versus the people that have more skills, that have more education, those people are actually gaining and that's where we actually see the employment growth happening. So um, overall, we see that employment grows, but there's really a, a change in terms of who are the winners and who are the losers that we have to keep in mind. Well, that dovetails nicely with what James teed up as well as you alluded to, especially the, the question being maybe less, what does this look like in the net and more specifically, how do you make this transition as effectively as possible, which leads nicely to introducing Becca Montgomery, who was a senior policy advisor for uh, Senator Michael Bennett from Colorado. Um, Becca and I have uh, been in touch over the last year, and I know that she has been closely engaged in thinking about artificial intelligence and the future of employment. Uh, Becca, welcome, and thanks for being with us. Thanks. Can I just say what James and Elizabeth said and leave it at that? <laughs> uh, we are, um, yes to what they said, I'm Jason too, I don't want to leave you out. Um, we are really focused on, on answering James's question, which is how do we, how at a policy level, at a federal policy level, do we support a system that enables people to gain the skills that they need throughout their lifetimes and not all at, not necessarily all at once so that when their jobs change, they can go get the skills they need and then get back into the workforce. Um, and then in addition to that, how do we make sure that everyone has access to those, those opportunities and it's not dependent on your affluence or your ability to afford it at the outset? Because as Elizabeth said, a lot of the people most in need of the uh, skill acquisition and training are also the ones that are potentially making less money or have less opportunity to take time away from work to get more skills. That's super helpful. And, um, and I know Jason has some thoughts about ongoing skill acquisition, the role of credentialing. Um, and as Becca alluded to, there are some very interesting questions about equity and access to uh to those tools as we go forward so we'll we'll pick that up as we uh pick up the third part of this panel so i want to circle back um thanks everybody for being with us I, i'll just say to everybody who is joining um we've had a few prep conversations and i think we're in for a real treat this is a great group that's been assembled i want to thank professor certain for architecting this conference as well as the full silicon flatirons team that makes this happen uh, grateful to be part of it. Let's start with um, the first topic in terms of how does the transition to uh, an employment um, force that is working with AI tools, working with machine learning tools, how does this transition compare to past disruptions? And James, maybe I'll turn to you first. You've studied some of this and looked at past disruptions in, say, Europe. Maybe uh, start there for us, please.
James, you're on mute. That, that, that's our first one. So for those playing bingo at home, that's our first uh, mute. Uh, <laughs> I'll do the same thing. I'm terrible. James? I'm terrible with the mute button. Yeah, so. Uh, All okay. good. Uh, what was I saying? Yes. Oh, well, you missed that part. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, we can probably identify two, two big things that may be different about past changes. One is potentially the pace of change. Um, we have to be a little careful about that one because things certainly changed you know, rapidly from a, from a much lower baseline in the past. And the other is the extent of the economy affected. Um, and again, we can qualify that a little, you know, you think about agriculture, which was 70% of the workforce back in 150 years ago. Um, while AI and, and IT generally, information technology generally, uh, affect a very large two thirds of the workforce now, um, that may not be so much larger, but I'll, I'll grant it that those things are potentially different. Um, I think it's important also though to highlight about what's the same. And, and, and this is a key thing that people don't understand. So people uh, generally assume that if uh, automation, if AI or other technology is able to automate a job or part of a job, that people will lose jobs. And we can point to examples where that's true. Uh, so the US textile industry had about 400,000, over 400,000 production workers in the 1940s. Today, they have fewer than 20,000. Uh, in the recent years, part of that is because of globalization, but most of that decline was because of automation. Um, but that, it, things don't necessarily work that way. So for instance, uh, the automated teller machine, which certainly automated work that tellers did, came along, uh, was widely deployed in the, from 1995 to 2005, and the number of bank tellers actually grew. Um, so why, why does it seem that sometimes employment can grow with automation and other times decline, sometimes precipitously? Well, we can go back to the textile workers and get a clue because it, before, for over 100 years before 1940, there was heavy automation in the textile industry and employment grew robustly. Uh, so employment was growing throughout the 19th century in, in the textile industry. There were more and more weavers and spinners and um, what was going on, what people forget about, uh, I mean, there, I, think, I think it's more complicated than this, but one key thing they forget about is the role of consumer demand. So uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, cloth was extremely expensive. Uh, the typical person had one set of clothing. Uh, automation came along and made it so that you needed less labor to produce a yard of cloth. But in a competitive market, that meant that the price went down. And because there was so much pent up demand for cloth, because it had been so expensive and people had so little of it, they just bought a whole lot more cloth. So they, they in fact, bought so much more cloth, demand increased so much that even though it, it required less labor per yard, it required more labor to produce all the cloth they were now producing. You get to the mid, -19th, mid 20th century and people have full closets, they're using lots of cloth. Automation is still coming along, reducing the amount of labor required to produce a yard of cloth. The price is still dropping somewhat, uh, but there just isn't that pent up demand anymore. And so it, then the labor saving effect dominates. Um, when we think about AI affecting different occupations, uh, a similar thing is going on now. So we, we see many instances like the ATM where information technology comes along and actually increases employment and others where it decreases employment. It's key to understanding what's going on that there's going to be some places it increases, some places it decreases. But again, that, that ties into the story about why, why we should be exper ex expecting transitions. The fact that things are that this technology is affecting a broad swath of the economy doesn't change that basic story. And in fact, the, the, the possibility that it is happening more rapidly doesn't change the story because if, if, if demand is penned up, more rapid automation simply means more rapid job growth. Uh, but what it does, what the rapidity means is that the transitions that people have to have uh, and, and the, the, what the scope of the 
the, the technology applied to so many different occupations means that, that, that a lot of people are going to be transitioning uh, at once. And that's where the real burden comes. James, I'm going to ask a, a follow up question and invite other panelists to, to chime in here momentarily. But um, I really like the specific examples of historical points in which a transition has been required. I know you've also looked at um, some Dutch examples from the middle of 19th century. Let's get that up on the table and then we'll invite some panelists discussion around this. Well, no, so the, the, Dutch, the Dutch research is actually current day. So um, the Netherlands happens to be one country that actually records the amount that, that firms spend on automation on a, on a plant by plant basis. And we can tie in, they also record uh, and have accessible to, made accessible to us uh, data on individual workers. So we, we see what happens when, when firms automate. Um, and, and, this, and this, is, this is very current day. And, and what, you know, what we're seeing is um, people do experience a burden. It's not a, uh, I, I should say, it's not a, a, a severe burden necessarily, but th they experience about a, incumbent workers at firms that automate will experience a, a, a loss of about 11% of one year's wages. So that's, think of that about $4,000. Um, that comes mainly because some workers uh, separate and they're unemployed for a while. Um, the, uh, the Dutch social safety net doesn't really compensate them for those losses, uh, only, only to a small degree. Um, but we're seeing that lots and lots of people are being affected. Um, so that, you know, that again ties in with, with this view that it's, it's, uh, it's not mass un unemployment, it's, it's these transitions. Uh, let me invite other panelists to chime in on a, a few, and I'll highlight a couple points that James made. One is, in terms of what might be different, the pace of change may be different. Uh, and second, James highlighted the extent of changes may be different. But there's other ways in which we can view this as similar to past transitions insofar as um, in the net, ex ante, it's not clear whether there might be new jobs created out of this or jobs that reduced, but the primary focus needs to be on what skills are going to be required. Um, Elizabeth, any thoughts about uh, those issues as to how this transition in the workforce looks similar or different than past ones? Um, yeah, no, I think I, I agree with James and that it really depends on um, the type of technology, whether or not like how it, how it might change jobs. So maybe I'll talk a little bit here about my research about computerization of, of office support jobs. Um, because this is, you know, this is research looking at how jobs have been changing over the last few years, but it's still, you know, automation and, and machine learning and AI is something that's still kind of really just now coming and becoming a part of jobs. And so that's more looking towards the future. Um, but so really, if you think about what's the role of technology and how it might change jobs, you can think about which tasks that a worker is performing might be replaced by technology. And so that really gets into kind of the nitty gritty, a lot of the details that they were talking about in the first session today about sort of what does the technology do, what, um, how do workers interact with that technology. And so you can think about whether or not it's replacing sort of the easy parts of the job. Um, and in that case, maybe the job is becoming more skilled. Or is it replacing the harder parts of the job? And in that case, the job actually might be becoming less skilled. And so if we think about sort of in the history of, of automation or of technological change, um, if we think about sort of the rise of uh, textiles, right? It went from being something that was a very skilled artisans produced fabric and that was a really skilled job. And now it's mechanized and very, you know, children were working in factories, right? And so that type of technological change actually pushed us towards, um, made the job less skilled. And so that gets into sort of what's the nature of the technology and how that interacts with the skills that the workforce um, already has, right? Um, and so, you know, when we looked at the computerization of office support jobs, so here we're looking at, these are like secretaries, right? And so, you know, it used to be that every office, like you think about the Mad Men era, right? Every office was full of a secretarial pool. It was a very large fraction of employment, especially female employment, was secretaries, right? 
And then in the 80s, computers became you know, a part of the workflow and all of a sudden a single worker could do a lot more tasks and a lot more of the jobs that you used to require many more people to do. Um, and so when you look at the tasks of the job, you know, people have predicted that, you know, secretaries and office support workers, these are jobs that can be completely automated and maybe we'll, we won't have any more secretaries in the future. Um, and so what we did is we actually looked at, well, what are the tasks that uh, are showing up in job postings? How does that relate to the rise of technology and jobs? Um, and we find that actually these jobs, the tasks are changing, right? And so they're, because they have to interact with the software, these workers now are actually being asked to be more skilled workers because the, it's not just that the technology comes in and replaces their job, they're using the technology and they're using the software and they're using, you know, even, you know, you can do automation of tasks in Microsoft Excel or in Microsoft Word, right? Using macros and things like that. That can actually really speed up your workflow and you can reproduce the work of a lot of, a lot of individuals, but it's the secretary herself that's actually doing that task, right? And so what we find is that these jobs, there's fewer of them, right? We still see that employment in these jobs is falling, but the people that remain, they're being asked to do more things, their jobs are broadening, they're more skilled, um, and actually they're bringing in tasks that used to be performed by other people in the office, so other higher skilled managers or accountants, those tasks are actually coming into these office support jobs probably because they're more skilled and they're able to do more things. So if we think about like the secretary of the future, it's a very different job and it's a more skilled job, um, but it all has to do with sort of what are the tasks that they're performing, what are the skills that they have and whether or not they're working with, uh, with the technology versus the technology's replacing part of their job. James. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to add a point to that, which is we tend to think of technology as automating the tasks or replacing uh, human tasks. And a lot of what technology does is actually to enhance human capabilities. I mean, technology is a tool. It lets you do more things. Um, we conducted, we just completed a second survey of AI startups. And one of the questions we ask is, uh, what is the benefit you're startup technology provides this, provides your customers what what do they get out of it and the the most frequent thing people answer is are, are categories where the technology improves ca customer capabilities it lets them manage data it lets them predict the future it lets them make better decisions um, all of those things are requiring the kinds of skills eliza was talking about uh, so it's it's a mistake to think about technology just as replacing humans let me ask a question about what we can know ex ante before the technology transition really occurs so maybe i'll start with elizabeth as a follow-up if you could go back and think about you know say circa 1980 1985 uh, before office workers were enabled by this um, software transition could we have seen that the skill level required for those positions would be enhanced? Could we have seen the net effect of whether jobs would be created or not? Or is that something that we can only see in the rear view mirror? Uh, Elizabeth, why don't you go first? And then Jason, I know that you're thinking about some of these things in terms of credentialing. Uh, but Elizabeth, take a whack at that one, please. Right. So that's that is a hard question because there is this divide between, you know, the technology may be feasible, but whether or not it's affordable and makes sense from a business perspective. Right. So if we think about like, you know, there's there is this like pizza pizza robot, right? That there was, you know, oh, a robot can make a pizza and that's going to replace, you know, pizza workers. I don't think so, right? Because just because it's possible to build this robot, you're still going to want to hire high schoolers and it's going to be a lot more affordable to hire high schoolers to, to make your pizzas, right? And so one part of it is just because the technology is feasible doesn't mean it's going to make sense from a business perspective to be implementing the technology. But I think on the other hand, you know, if um, workplaces, you know, started working with computers and they could see how word processing software that really saves a lot of time versus, you know, keeping typing, retyping and retyping things, right? And so I think it was probably, you could see that that was there, but then, you know, understanding what skills it would take to be able to work well with the software, I think that would have been something that you could see, but whether or not, you know, predicting 
how that was going to change the jobs. And in particular, I think the thing that's hard to predict, which we see in our research, is that the new tasks that become part of the job, right? And that's something that's a dynamic that happens in the office environment, right? So maybe you spend less time typing, and you say, oh, I can help out with this other task that used to be someone else's job, right? And so that's very fluid and dynamic that isn't necessarily going to be easy to see uh, before the fact. Yeah, and I'll add uh, maybe a friendly uh, addition it occurs to me that when James was talking about consumer demand around textiles or how consumers would respond to the rise of the ATM, until we have products in the marketplace, it's very difficult to know what that consumer demand is going to look like. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the ATM is a great example, right? Because, you know, people thought you'd have ATMs and, you know, bank teller jobs would go away. It turns out we have more bank tellers now than when the ATM started. Now they do different things, they require different skills. So the person who's really good at taking a $100 bill and putting out 520s probably doesn't have a, have a job. But you know, I heard this fact, I went home, my wife's bank teller, I was like, well, what do you do all day? We do all of our banking online. Why do people come see you? And she's like, a lot of it's personal interaction, right? Really can do almost anything other than getting a cashier's check. But her job is sales, right? Her job is to interact with the people and then get them over to the person who's doing the mortgage banking or doing the business loans. And if you have that sort of soft social skill ability, this actually creates a higher value job. And, you know, this is really what we've seen over the, over the past years between 1980 and 2015, uh, growth in high school jobs was 68% as opposed to 31% in, in, in lesser skill jobs. Uh, you know, what the rule that's been true from the industrial revolution, at least to the early part of this century has been Keynes's theory of technological unemployment right? Technology, you know, economic growth from technolo technological advances outpaces uh, job losses. So you have a short-term job loss, but in the long run, you have more jobs uh, created. Uh, for example, in the 1960s, uh, computerization probably cost 3.5 million jobs, but created 19 million new ones. The question of what we're going to see here in, in AI and ML is, is that going to continue to be true? And I think what you see is because of the pace of change driven by them, the pace of change from data analysis, you're going to see uh, some of that transition happen more suddenly. Uh, it's going to be faster. It's going to be harder for people to, 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 to adjust. And that leads ultimately to the focus on skills. How do we identify what skills are emerging? How do we identify what skills AI and ML uh, you know, are able to do and, and so become, become less relevant? Uh, and and you know, you know, one thing that we've done is we've created the skills ontology. We've taken 200 million skills from ONET and from other sources and divide them to 55,000 canonical skills. Like there's lots of ways of describing whether you're proficient at Microsoft Word. And then you can run AI analyses and see, right, what skills are in demands for jobs? What skills do people have? Where are their skills gaps? Uh, and then we can focus, you know, I'll get to it later, Brad, and talk about credentials about how to address this. But I know Becca wants to get in as well, so. Uh, I've got, uh, James was waving his finger at me first. So James, you get the first crack in there. Well, yeah, let me just, uh, I'll, I'll be brief and let, let, let Becca talk. But I, I think it's a mistake to think that, every, that there's sort of this juncture now and everything's gonna change. We've really been automating office jobs since the 1950s, okay? In, in the 1950s, you saw accounting jobs automated. Uh, you saw cr uh, loan offers or cr credit decisions automated. 1987, we had the first AI system commercially used uh, to detect credit card fraud. So th th every time there's a new wave, and it, you know, we, we, there's some uncertainty about how it's going to affect skills, how it's going to affect demand, but we can see more generically that in areas like financial services or many of the, um, you know, the, the office type jobs, uh, that there is generically strong demand. And we can also see that this, this, this pattern of skill upgrading has been going on now for, for with, you know, related to information technology, it's been going on now for over 60 years. So it's not, it's not like we're jumping off the bridge. It's, it's uh, things may be speeding up a bit more um, and may be affecting a lot more people. And it's changing, you know, it's not just now L lower skill clerical workers are being affected. It's it's also professionals and radiologists and and whatever. Uh, but uh, you know the from the the bigger picture is is one more of continuity than sharp change. Becca, 
I'd just like to add that I think this discussion goes to the need to have industry and education talking constantly about how, how the jobs are developing and what skills are needed. And so that we can, education, higher education and apprenticeships and everyone can react in real time to what's needed versus trying to develop a program and then have it be outdated by the time students are graduating from it. Um, Becca, let's come back to that here momentarily. J Jason, I might invite you to say a little bit more about um, well, first of all, I don't know if you have any reactions to, to James's assertion, which I think is an, an important one for us to consider, that automation needs to be viewed on a historical continuum. Mm -hmm. This is not entirely new, but put that in juxtaposition to, uh, I think we've also alluded to accelerating change uh, right. as well. So maybe a, a reaction to that and then talk about, as you guys, I think you said that there's a, you've built an ontology of 50,000 skills um, using AI to determine where, where things may be going. What are some of the directions that you think are significant as you look at those skills? Uh, super. So, you know, I think uh, I agree with James. I think it's just a question of, of degree, right? Technological change happens, happens over time. It's not sort of this instant uh, switch. I mean, we're facing obviously a, a moment in time where we're seeing a, a lot of job loss and a lot of transition due to COVID-19, uh, and, and, and so we, things may accelerate a little bit faster. But the nature of AI and ML, the, 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 the point that I was making in terms of this pace of change is we're seeing so many advances. We're seeing so much use of, of ML to make predictions, to enhance human decision making, to do things that, that previously humans were required to do, that I just think it's gonna be faster than say the industrial revolution, right? And again, both that pace of change and the fact that it affects people who are mid-career means people aren't going to go back and uh, get a law degree at the University of Colorado, as wonderful as, as that is, because it takes three years out of the labor force to, uh, and, and, uh, and some funding to do it. And so the question is, how do we position people to navigate this transition? And the great thing is, these technologies may be doing all these things, but they also can help us navigate it. So uh, our skills cloud, as I said, we took 200 million data points, you know, again, ONET surveys, information from employers, information from job boards, and, and really said, well, there are 200 million skills, what do they really mean? Is it MS Word, is it Microsoft Word, is it Microsoft Office? So we built this ontology, and it's not only that, but it shows relationships between skills. So we have a tool called Skills Miner, and it says, Jason, you say on your resume, you've got a skill in public policy. Do you also have a skill in, public, in government affairs? They're closely related. And it helps me identify more skills. It helps me build out my resume and my job profile. And then the interrelationship of those skills enables uh, you know, opportunities to, for example, connect people with jobs. So you can imagine you know, internally in my company, somebody's looking for a project that requires certain skills. They can list those out. They can find candidates who have those skills listed. If I'm looking for an opportunity to grow in, 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 in say, a stretch assignment, I can go there and look for opportunities that match those skills. So ultimately, by creating the sort of skills-based hiring, it's less about sort of my credentials, right? Like, you know, that's nice, but I uh, was out of school 25 years ago. So really, people should care more about the skills that I've demonstrated and then the proof I've had of those skills. And then that's where credentialing comes in, right? So it's nice that I had my educational credentials from undergraduate and from law school. Um, but what about things I've learned on the job? How do I credentialize those? If I go for a six-week uh, programming course to learn Python, or I go for a six-week course to learn how to become a plumber, how do I prove that? And how do I prove that out you know, broadly uh, to the community? Because ultimately, it's going to be those credentials and the ability to share them that allow me to demonstrate the skills and make those career transitions. I'd like to put um, two of those issues on the table for just a second. Uh, in terms of how the skills required um, get uh, distributed and credentialized. Let's hold that for just a second. I want to invite the other panelists to respond to Jason about what are the skills um, that are going to be prioritized or more highly valued in an AI and ML-enabled world. Uh, what are some of those that you see going? And then I want to tie that to something that Becca teed up, which is, um, and what parts of the population are exceptionally well positioned to transition to those skills? And which parts of the population are we worried about being able to transition to, to acquire those skills? Elizabeth, you want to take up first? 
Sure, right. So some of these things were talked about in the first session, but I think if you're thinking about how do you position yourself to have the skills that you need to succeed in the future, one thing is, what are the things that AI and machine learning are really bad at, right? And so if we think about things like soft skills and emotional intelligence, um, things like that, those are things that humans are great at, the technology is not so good at. So if you're thinking about sort of the longer term, those would be places um, where I think that there is a real human advantage. Um, but the other thing is, you know, skills that are really complementary with technology, right? And so skills that allow you to interface with this technology um, and, and really use it to your advantage. So one of the phrases from the first session was lawyer enhancing technology, right? And so this idea of using the technology that works, works with you and your skills and you can really uh, leverage it. Um, and then the last thing is just skills that are just prohibitively expensive for AI and machines to do. And those are going to be a lot more of the, you know, like I said before, the pizza making, right? So things that it doesn't make a lot of sense to build a dedicated robot to do this task. We're always going to have sort of lower skilled tasks for, for individuals to perform. James, any reaction to that from your end? Uh, and, and Becca, <laughs> oh, good. Sounds good. That's I, I agree. <laughs> Becca, anything that you'd add? I need some. Skills. No, I think I think <laughs> <laughs> I think Elizabeth nailed it. Um, I, yeah, I, I think that I guess yes. Actually, I do have something to add. The one thing that I would add is skills that uh, or jobs that are easily automated, meaning you're doing the same thing over and over again, like um, grocery store cashiers or fast food cashiers or others, I mean, that seems to me a place where automation is a real, is a real danger to the employee. Jason, anything that you'd add to that list that uh, Elizabeth teed up? No, I think she did. I think she did a great job in, in identifying it. So no, I, I don't really have anything to add there. Okay, let me invite you guys. Elizabeth, uh, but Elizabeth does. <laughs> Yeah. Elizabeth, anything thing. you'd like to add to your list? Yes, thank you. Well, I think there's also a little bit of an onus on employers to be thinking sort of a little bit more expansively about the value that their employees bring. So I was just thinking about Becca's point about, you know, cashiers are really, you know, jobs that we think that are really um, um, automatable or really repetitive, right? But then there's also other things that these individuals are doing. And so I think on the employer side of things, you need to be a little bit more aware of the value that your employees are bringing, right? And so a cashier, yes, you know, we have these automated checkouts. People still like to go through the lane and have it and talk to a cashier, right? And so it suggests to me there's a value that these individuals are bringing beyond just this, this automatable repetitive task. Let me um, put a fine point on the equity issue that Becca um, previewed at the outset, which is, um, all right, so Elizabeth, I'm going to summarize the, the points that you made in terms of skills that you anticipate will be prioritized. Uh, soft skills where humans are advantaged over machines. Second, skills that are complementary to the possibilities of new enabling technologies. Third, uh, skills that are prohibitively expensive to do in AI, subject to, I think, what Becca um, put out as a qualifying where even things that are prohibitively expensive in one or two instances, like say grocery checkout at scale might make sense that if you can do that across a full system. So those are three broad areas. As we think about populations that are well positioned to make the transition versus populations that are going to struggle, how do you size that up? Because that's going to have important, uh, uh, a lot of importance for how we think about public policy in the near term. Um, maybe I'll, I'll tee up. Elizabeth, you want to go first and then we'll go around on that. Sure. I mean, so some of the, the skills, the sort of uh, social intelligence skills or soft skills, those are often skills that our economy doesn't value very much, right? And so these could be things that are really, really valuable, like home health workers, things like that, but they're not necessarily well compensated. And I think the other part of it is that these are really female dominant jobs, which also means that they're not as well compensated. So there's some of what's going on is that, you know, it might be important to the economy and it might be important uh, uh, contribution, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be well compensated for individuals. Uh, others, as you think about populations, James, any thoughts about that? Yeah, so 
uh, I think that the point about caring jobs uh, is, is very important because um, it, I think there's a potential, and I, I mean, I've, I've, I've talked to AI researchers about some of those, those jobs. There's a potential that uh, those jobs can get technology that may enhance their value and, and hopefully then enhance their compensation. So we think about teachers. Um, there are people working to develop AI systems that can help a teacher customize uh, their lesson plans for individual students and make, uh, ideally, make the, the role of teacher much more important. We think about home health aides, uh, very poorly paid, but if more diagnostic tasks and tools can be in, in, in the hands of home health aides, um, they add value. And in, in, in the past, this was one of the things we saw in the, in the 19th century, when people can use the technology to develop, uh, develop skills that enhance the value. In other words, the home health aid, by working with those tools, the teacher, by working with those tools, becomes that much more valuable. And they develop their own specialized skills for dealing with it. Um, that eventually led to major increases in the pay of factory workers. Super interesting, Jason. Yeah. So I think that, you know, when we think about sort of impacted populations, we have to think about a couple. The, the first are obviously people who are just generally economically disadvantaged, technologically disadvantaged. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting, you see how skills evolve over time. In the, you know, early 1900s, you had master craftsmen building cars from scratch, that was high skilled. Then you went to, you know, Henry Ford's factories, you had to be able to turn a wrench. Skills were less important there. Then as increased robotics meant that robots were doing more of the car building, you needed different things. Skills tend to, need for skills tend to increase. And we're on a scale where probably high school jobs are going to continue to increase. And we're going to need those soft skills. So that's obviously going to you know, have an impact on those populations and we're gonna to need to have policy solutions that help address that. And then the other population I'd really highlight are people who are uh, mid-career, right? You know, you know, those of us who, you know, are 25, 30 years out of school have been doing things, you know, we may be relatively adaptable, but this is a new change. We're not going to go back to school. We're going to have to learn how to work with technology. We're going to need to develop into these skills. We're going to have to switch into the new jobs that are created, right? There were no data scientists 10 years ago. Now that's the really hot field. Uh, and so, you know, in addition to sort of the, the, the groups that we always think about as, as, as having concerns about access to the labor market and the ability uh, 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 to participate, we need to think about people who are in the labor market who are going to be experiencing these changes and are going to need to adjust in ways they may not have anticipated. James, go ahead. So um, I, I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball in here. I think um, one of the things about these new technologies, and I think this is true of major new technologies in general, is that a lot of the skills need to be acquired through experience by working with a technology. And that places a whole new burden on things. But it's also, we also have to recognize it's a different kind of skill. So people have talked about the, the factory workers as being unskilled. But in fact, it, they had a different kind of skill. They had to learn it on the job. And we have strong evidence that they learned very valuable skills on the job. So it was different than what the artisan textile, the artisan weavers did, but th those skills became very important. Um, but they eventually had to develop the right sort of labor market institutions so that those skills could be properly compensated. And that's where things like credentialing becomes very important to, to the challenges today that, when people learn skills on the job, it's often difficult for them to be properly compensated for it. So a lot of the opportunity that's emerging, I think, ties into that, that issue. It, uh, I'm going to tee up Becca, who's going to jump in here momentarily. I just want to highlight the, um, in the formal language that you talked about is the distinction between tacit knowledge versus formal knowledge. You know, tacit knowledge often being knowing in doing. And to your point, James, there was a very specific uh, type of tacit knowledge that factory workers had in, in, in how to do. Um, and it's really interesting to think about how tacit knowledge works as part of this transition of skills. Becca, go ahead. I think that I think there will be jobs at every skill, le skill level available in the future. I think the, the group that's most at risk is the one that doesn't have the capacity to go get the additional training or hands-on experience that's needed to get to that next job. Um, so I think 
no matter what you're talking about, if you can't afford to take the time or get the credential, then you're stuck. Um, so those would be the most at risk from an equity perspective. So that's a great transition into policy measures. Uh, what steps need to be or should be on the menu to consider as we think about um, transitioning individuals to the new jobs that are coming. Um, Jason, maybe we'll start with you. I know that you've been thinking about some, some ways that uh, the skill acquisition in the near term future may not look like the past. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, from, from our perspective, I think there are really three policy measures we'd love to see government take to help uh, address this. At, at a high level, uh, the first one is uh, more uh, incentives and support for employer based training. It's much easier to get trained with, for a skill when you're employed than having to like access training when you're when you're unemployed right we need both right we we're again going through this period of time right now where there's a huge amount of unemployment but you know uh you know that you know there have been various bills and, and things and, and you know you know senator warner and others have, have talked about in terms of providing that incentive and to be able to do that and then do that in a way that's credentialed so it's not just that i get trained with something but then i'm able to prove it out so that brad when i come to you and apply for a job that you can have confidence that i can actually not only have that skill but i can demonstrate it uh, the second thing is, you know, building support for credentialing. Are we going to be able to use more, you know, individual access education funds and others to access credentialing programs as opposed to four-year degrees? Are we going to create an accreditation system for credentials? It's great if I go take a six-week course to learn Python, but how do I know, again, Brad, when I come to you for a job, that you're going to accept that certification rather than the others? Like, we, we, you know, I know my law degree is generally going to be accepted, so how do we build a, a system that allows me to get credentials and have the confidence they can they can, um, you know, that those will be valuable and recognized. We don't have the equivalent of credential for-profit colleges. Uh, and then the third thing that we really need is a continuing, you know, uh, increased data. We really need an ONET 2.0. Uh, right now, ONET does a lot of information. It gets it through surveys. It's at an MSA level. We need something that's more granular, more specific, accesses automated data sources, brings in data from elsewhere in the government and elsewhere in the private sector. Uh, and that can, again, help power these, these analytics and help us identify new jobs that are emerging, new skills, and then people can tailor credential programs. Uh, you know, I could talk a lot more about this, but those are sort of the three points that we really feel uh, are, are important here from a, from a government policy perspective. All right, that's a very clear uh, framework for us to use as a starting point. Jason, before we uh, go to other panelists, can you say a little bit more about what ONET is? Uh, I know many people who are tuning in may not be familiar with that. And then when you say ONET 2.0, maybe elaborate as to why that is part of uh, your three-part proposal. <laughs> well, Becca may be more, more familiar with this than I am, but fundamentally ONET is a set of information on you know, occupations, on jobs, and how they're growing and changing. Uh, the, the Department of Labor gets, uh, again, primarily through survey data, and it's available out there. It, you know, uh, it, it, anybody can use, as I mentioned, it was one of the sources that we used in building, in, in building Skills Cloud. And it's an incredibly valuable resource, right? Because you know the federal government's in a great position to understand the labor market and the labor economy in the United States. Um, but again, it's done at an MSA level, which is nice. But even you know, it's even important. Some MSAs are really large to get more granular. And we need to get uh, you know more focus on skills, more focus on emerging jobs, more real time data. Right? Survey data is great, but getting real time data that that sort of automated whether from unemployment claims whether from 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 job postings or other things to build that out is is valuable and so you know i don't know that we have sort of a very detailed conception of an onet 2.0 but you know again to be able to identify those skills to be able to identify those emerging jobs we need to be able to bring together these job sources in a new and and comprehensive way All right so um Jason has presented at least three different ideas, and I want to invite panelists to add to this uh, potential me menu. Uh, first is more incentives and support for employer-based training. Second, increased emphasis on credentialing, including potentially an accreditation mechanism for credentials that occur outside of traditional higher education systems. And third, uh, a more expansive and enhanced version of ONET uh, and ONET 2.0. Becca, what else would you add in any reactions to those three proposals? Yeah, um, I think that's the first time that this week, at least, that someone has said that the federal government is in a really good place to understand something. So <laughs> I 
thanks for putting that out there. Um, so I think uh, I, I just would like to add, um, Senator Bennett actually has a bill that would allow financial aid to be applied to the uh, certification and credentialing programs that Jason has referred to. Um, the, the key there, as he alluded to, is quality. Um, we need a way to make sure that we're setting the right outcomes and requirements so that we're not we're not giving money to students to get a credential that doesn't mean anything in the real world. Um, and the other one of the other areas that we've spent a lot of time is on apprenticeships, um, specifically apprenticeships that are partnerships between industry, higher ed, and students, so that a student can go into an apprenticeship and get compensated for the apprenticeship, get the training, on-the-job training that we've all said is so important, but also get a get some sort of credit or credential in, in the higher ed space so that they can use that training to go to the next level of, of employment or skills level that they'd like to seek later on. Um, and then the last thing I would add to the list is that we need to think holistically about this, the people in the jobs um, and think about the barriers that are outside of the training that may be stopping them from accessing or taking the time. So things like childcare and affordable housing and Healthcare, all can all can stop a person from taking the time to get the training or being able to take off work to get the training. And so, we as a we as a society need to do a better job of creating a support system that will enable people to get smarter and get more skills. Uh, Elizabeth, James, any additions to the those items on the policy menu that you'd want to add and or reactions to what you've heard so far? Elizabeth, why don't you go first? Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think those are all important, important things to, to pay attention to. And the other thing, it's just that, you know, hopefully, ideally, we would keep people from having these disruptions in terms of job loss and having to sort of scramble and find another job, but it is important to have the support for people if that does happen to them, right, in terms of having access to, you know, unemployment insurance and also access to training um, that they can get after, after a potential job loss. But I think also going back to sort of what's the employer's responsibility, right? So employers should also be thinking about ways that they can maintain these workers in other roles, for instance, right? So just because you're automating, just because you're adopting new technology, it's possible that you can provide the training and you can also um, keep working with the same employees instead of just sort of shedding off a portion of your labor force. I think that dovetails nicely with what Jason proposed in terms of employee-based uh, training in, in more expansive ways. Uh, let's come back to that in a moment. James, any reactions from your end or additional policy steps? All of these, this you is know, all of these sound, things sound great. I can probably throw in a, a few more that I, th I think some people are doing. M maybe Becca was considering this, but I, in addition to apprenticeship work study programs, um, so where community colleges team with local employers, um, it's not formally apprenticeship, but it's a very similar idea. And I think the key thing is it gets it gets people both sorts of knowledge. Um, I think, and in, in also in addition to um, the uh, kinds of uh, um, social safety net things Becca was talking about, I, we have to talk about temporary support while people are unemployed. Uh, we're going to see people with spells of unemployment. Um, Another thing, this is something I've seen that private employers are doing more, is setting up mentoring programs. So DuPont has a very uh, interesting initiative where they identify experts in new technologies within the company and ways for people throughout the company to, to access those experts. That, that becomes an important capability. And then maybe this is beyond policy, but I think we have to recognize we're, we're also talking here ultimately about a cultural change, that we're talking about a change in attitudes about education, that we're going from a world which I, I think is still, our educational institutions are still oriented largely to a world where you learn when you're young and that lasts you a career to one where we have lifetime continuous learning. Um, and, and that's going to, I don't know how to solve that problem entirely. It's clearly going to require change. And, K through 12 and uh, every other aspect of our educational system. Uh, but that's a big underlying challenge. Um, before we transition to, to questions from um, those who are in attendance, which we'll turn to here momentarily, I can't resist asking as someone who's at a university, uh, as is Elizabeth and James, what role do you see universities playing 
in this um, world if, if we assume that there is a cultural change that's going to be effectuated by necessity along the lines of what James just said, that is one of continuous education. Um, what are some of the roles that universities at least should play and thoughts about whether that will happen? James, I noticed you took yourself off mute. Why don't you take the first swing? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm well, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, James and then Jason. Was Jason, James. were you talking to Jason? Rather? Yeah, I was, Jason, I, I, yeah, sorry about that. Jason, go ahead. So, so look, universities are going to be incredibly valuable, right? Because, it, because universities provide a foundation, an educational foundation that helps support that lifetime learning, right? Um, you know, I was a geology major, as you can tell from the geologic map of Wyoming that's behind me, right? No one has asked me a sedimentology question in 25 years in my career, and I don't expect one, you know, in the near future. But the learning how to think and the skills that you gain there you know, are translatable into, into other things. And so, and so that is gonna be continued to be an important foundation. And then on top of that, the ability of universities to package that into programs that are of shorter duration than degrees that are increasingly around certificates can play an important role as part of that sort of credentialing system in addition to sort of that foundational uh, baseline uh, uh, skill set that, that's so valuable for that lifelong learning. Elizabeth. Great. I know I absolutely agree with that. And I think also with sort of the rise of, of online learning. So one of the things that my school has started is we have an online master's program and then we also have a certificate, which is just a couple of classes and then you get the certificate. And that's the kind of thing that sort of people can continue to come back to through their careers. And as as educators, we can update the curriculum as things are changing. Right. And so that sort of allows the sort of lifelong process of learning as things continue to change. All right, well, let's um, turn to questions um, from participants who are, are uh, involved in viewing. And um, I'm using the question and answer uh, portion here. So if uh, you want to add questions, I'll, I'll go down here. Um, let's start with uh, the question, could someone speak to, to or provide resources, articles about that would help us understand how AI technology will be used in employment hiring practices? and what kind of oversight there might be about that technology. Jason, I suspect you guys are thinking hard about this. Um, what about the questions about oversight with respect to technology that will be used? Right, so yes, we are thinking hard about this. You know, like many companies, uh, we publish a set of AI ethics principles about the importance of respect for privacy, the importance of, of minimizing uh, bias, the importance of transparency around, you know, how AI algorithms work. Uh, we've done uh, work with the, the EU high-level expert group uh, in terms of validating against their framework that they've done there. Uh, we've been advocates on Capitol Hill. Becca, I'd be happy to talk with you more about this, about getting uh, NIST to create a, a set of uh, 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 AI framework, just like it has a cybersecurity framework and its privacy framework, you know, great public-private partnership to, to do that. I think there's sort of oversight in, in, in three areas. The first is these public private partnerships, you know, the things that government can do to encourage private sector uptake of responsible practices like the cybersecurity framework and bringing something put into AI is important. Secondly, we have to remember that all of the existing rules uh, around uh, bias and discrimination apply, right? There's no special carve out for AI. It's subject to the same type of rules that people are subject to in employment decisions. Uh, and then I think the third thing is, you know, we are going to see moves towards increased regulation. I think in the past panel, they talked about, you know, rules and automated, automated decision making under GDPR. We've seen very similar proposals in virtually every uh, privacy, federal privacy bill in Congress. Uh, we're very hopeful one of those privacy bills passes. We expect it would pass with one of those. Uh, and so there is a role for government regulatory insight. After all, it is society that decides how technology is used. Uh, but there's also a, a, a core role for companies to act in, in, in responsible manners. And again, the way we've approached it is to start with things that are, that, uh, are you know, that, that make sense that pose low risk, like skills minor, right? The ability of me to like, figure out how, how to better express myself on resumes and then you know, taking skills and being able to identify with jobs. I mean, there, you know, and so uh, it, it's going to be a journey. Uh, we're, we're going to learn as we go along that journey. But again, there's a lot uh, that, can be, that can be done by, by industry, and there's definitely a role for government. Anyone else want to jump in on that? 
All right, thanks. Uh, next question. Should we be concerned about extreme wealth inequality in Piketty's projection of increasing returns on capital? If so, can AIML policy address that inequality? James? Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I think there's a concern that AI or information technology generally has been contributing to wealth inequality. Uh, and I don't see that it's going to help address it. Um, one of the things we see is that, uh, you know, we talk about access to the technology. Access is to some extent, um, we, we, this is a technology that's, that's highly concentrated among the largest firms. Uh, that means in effect that they have an advantage uh, but that also means that access has tended to be limited. We're seeing less, we, economists talk about diffusion of technology, that once there's a new idea, somebody will, will use it for a while, but that within a short period of time, it will be spread throughout the economy and others will be able to use it. And that means that others will be able to gain experience with it and, and gain, acquire skills uh, that complement that technology. And that, that's always been an important part of the way that the benefits of technology transfer ultimately to the to the working classes um, what we're seeing with ai is is a bit troubling because it seems to be much more concentrated and we have evidence that diffusion is um, going down that there's an increasing gap in productivity between the the, the best and largest firms and the rest um, and that threatens to uh, make inequality worse also also threatens to increase differences between regions, between urban and rural, um, and a number of divisions. Let me ask a follow-up question uh, based on what an entrepreneur in the, um, the med tech space told me uh, a month or two ago, which is he said, in, in essence, you know, from somewhere around 1990 until the last few years, there were a series of technology advances that allowed for new competition in the form of new companies and startups, whether it was just drops in cost of capital, you didn't have to build out all parts of the infrastructure to do a startup, uh, broadband technology, et cetera. And he said, what's given him pause the last couple of years is the advantages of being large with respect to data that you either already have access to or that you have in your records somewhere and what large companies are going to be able to um, capitalize on in terms of ML and AI. Now this is a, a, a related but really separate question of where the jobs are gonna be, because you could imagine companies that are very large having new jobs that are created, but in terms of a question of the competitive landscape, do you have concerns along those lines that access to data is the new uneven competitive advantage for large companies? James? Yeah, I think that's, well, I think that's somewhat of a problem. I think information technology more generally has been, has contributed to inequality and has created these gaps between companies and, and created, made it more difficult for startups. So information technology in the early, in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, was something that leveled the playing field to a great degree. Um, one of the statistics we've we've tabulated is the uh, um, if you look at the top four firms in every industry, what's the likelihood that one of those top four firms will be displaced by somebody else? Turnover, disruption, uh, and disrupt that sort of rate of disruption was increasing up and in, you know from the 1970s up until around 2000, late 90s, uh, but it's been decreasing since then. And so we're I th and a lot of this is connected to large IT systems that uh, are giving large firms these great capabilities. AI will enhance that. Part of that advantage comes from data. We, we, we did a survey of, of startups and asked them a bunch of data, you know, how much is data a, a barrier to entry to you and how, you know, how, how important is data? And data is clearly very important. Uh, startups, are, it seems, are able to get data from a variety of sources and often from their customers. So it's not a complete lockout, but you know, data is one aspect. Just the sheer level of investment in in AI, which is it's very heavily dominated by 
you know, a dozen or so firms. Um, all of these things are, are pointing to uh, possible concerns about future inequality. Um, Jason, I'm going to address the next two questions directly to you. One is uh, a reference back to the ONET typology uh, in public and information, is that publicly available? If so, or can someone go get it? And second, are we able to access, access the workday skills ontology? Have you made that public? It, the answer on the ONET data is that it's publicly accessible and so I can go get it. I'll see if I can find, you know, uh, and post in, in the chat sort of where, where that is sometime before, before we end. Uh, workday skills cloud, think of it as, the way we think about it is sort of is, a, is, is that the foundational technology, right? Like it's, it's, uh, not something like we offer to our customers the way we might offer an HCM service. It's basically a tool that powers various services, whether it's skills minor, whether it's the, you know, an opportunity marketplace. Uh, and so, for example, we just announced last week that uh, a, a partnership with Opportunity at Work, uh, which is a nonprofit in D.C. that's really focused on what they call STARS, uh, people skilled through alternative routes to, uh, you know, build a skills cloud API that they can then access uh, to help both match uh, those stars with the people who are posting jobs on their marketplace uh, and also help those stars, you know, build out their resumes and identify skills. Um, so the answer is no, it's not, it's not publicly available. It's really a tool that we use to drive uh, both, you know, services that we offer our customers uh, and also, uh, you know, as a foundation for our tech for good partnerships. Uh, next question is, uh, relates to education and training programs that are already being offered within industry. Uh, what does that look like? And to the extent that you're examining or studying company retraining programs, are they moving fast enough? And are there examples that we might look at as um, things that we might want to amplify going forward? Anyone have insight as to this? Jason, as you look at um, existing training or education programs that are out there today, are there some models that you think this is perhaps where the future should be going? Um, I don't have a, a particular view on that other than, you know, what we talked about, which is I think it's going to have to be sort of shorter things, either things that I do on my job where I earn credentials uh, or a, a program, whether it's through a community college or whether it's through uh, an accredited uh, program that, that, that provide, again, provides something at the end that's a credential uh, that, per what Becca was saying, is widely accepted as of high quality. Um, and so, uh, you know, the others are probably better positioned to just talk about sort of what makes an effective, uh, an effective training program. From our point of view, it's, it's really, again, this uh, this credentialization, uh, the fact that it's going to have to need, need to be short term, and the ability of these credentials again to be sort of interoperable and used broadly in the marketplace are the things that we've really focused on. Elizabeth, when you studied uh, office workers um, and the changes engendered by in, in the early '80s, did you see anything in the way of intentional company retraining programs that strike you as equally or more appropriate today? Well, that's interesting. So we were really just looking at job ads. So we were measuring how the jobs were changing. So this was less on sort of an active employer side of, you know, we're trying to train people and give them new skills and more, let's just buy it from the marketplace, right? So they're saying, these are the skills that we want, somebody deliver them to us. So I actually don't know as much about sort of the training and skills development side of things. All right, uh, next question uh, is how could we help employers see the applicability of past technology changes uh, navigations in candidates. So I think the, the question here is, how could you surface to an employer that you have made changes and acquired new skills over time? Um, and the background here is that this individual is reskilled in 2009, 2011, 2015 with short-term certifications, something that sounds like Jason along the lines of, what you uh, are calling for. Uh, and yet, this individual is finding that new job opportunities are asking for more or less creation from scratch in roles that uh, the individual has already been working in. Any thoughts about ways to sort of package the changes that have happened outside of, say, the big 
um, formal four-year degree. Yeah. So, um, so one of the things we've done, I talked about the skills gap, but one, another product that we're working on is, is work day credentials and a way to app so that when an individual like the person who asks the question uh, ends up with that certification, whether it's from their employer, whether it's from a third party program or elsewhere, uh, they end up getting a certification that is on the app. Uh, and with that certification, they can then share that with other employers. And it's got a blockchain back in that makes it provable and it proves a couple things. First of all, it proves that the issuer of the certification actually issued it. It also proves that the individual was the one that actually chose to share it. So it's under their under their control. They can sh choose to share it, Brad, with you and not share it with James. Um, uh, it's highly verified uh, and and it's and it's and it's secure. And so it, and then we have to correspond with that with sort of that mechanism about how to do that. And of course, uh, there's a broader sort of interoperable learning records work that uh, the White House and, and companies, including ours, are participating in. Uh, combine that with working with employers to uh, encourage growing use and growing acceptability of these credentials and a focus again to skills-based hiring, right? A lot of job descriptions talk about what's past experience, what are sort of general qualifications, how do we really rewrite job descriptions in a way that focus on skills and then look for proofs of those, of those skills. So there's both a cultural change for employers and then the need to build in a, a way that makes it easy to share uh, credentials uh, like the, you know, the product work that we're doing. Becca, then Elizabeth. Becca? I, you know, I can't speak for all employers all over the country, but I can say that we've been engaged with several big ones on this topic of AI and automation. And the thing that we hear more than anything is that their employees need to be lifelong learners and that they need to be ready to acquire new skills because the technology is changing so fast. And so I think in answer to the question, it's, it is valued um, in the companies that we've been engaged with because they understand that the economy is changing quickly. Elizabeth? Right, so I was thinking along the same lines as Becca and this idea that, you know, for if you're hiring someone for a longer term position, you also want to be able to find people that have this flexibility and this ability to, as technology continues to change, adapt with it. And so I think some of that onus is on employers in terms of trying to, how can you evaluate candidates, job candidates, not just on the skills that they currently have, but also on sort of their path and being able to see, is this someone that's likely to be able to adapt? And I think that's sort of a framework change for many employers in terms of a static skill set to more of a dynamic skill set that hopefully we'll see more of going forward. Uh, this next question speaks to the leverage between employers and employees or workers. And the question is, does the threat of AI or ML tools and capabilities alone operate to keep wages low or potentially depress wages, wages by creating a mindset that I'll take as a worker a low wage uh, with the belief that at least that might keep me from being outsourced to the machines. Um, James, maybe I'll, I'll take that as a little bit of a challenge to some of the things that you've said earlier in terms of uh, that the threat may not be as, as pronounced or acute as we, as we, we think. Uh, how do you respond to a question like that? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I, it's not just the technology. So there are, and with all of these technologies, there have always been employers who have seen it as a way of squeezing the workers, of you know, replacing them, of uh, treating them poorly. And at the same time, there are other employers who recognize the value of workers' contributions, capabilities, skills, uh, uh, and nurture uh, their, their workers, pay them a, a decent wage, and, uh, and, and provide them training opportunities. So these same differences apply. Um, it has much more to do with our institutions and our policies than with the technology itself. Okay, well, um, we've got some additional questions with apologies to a lot of the excellent questions that we're not going to have time to get to. We are scheduled to, to wrap up at 1150. Um, I want to say uh, a warm thank you to James, Jason, Becca, and Elizabeth. This has been a super stimulating discussion. Uh, many thank yous for joining and sharing the benefit of your insight. Uh, I will just kind of ask here, I think I can uh, I've now learned how to give that um, applause myself in terms of the, but oh, I'm looking for it, maybe not. Uh, but anyway, so uh, 
thank you for uh, a terrific discussion. And uh, Vanessa, Harry, back to Silicon Flatiron Central. Do we have some formal wrap up at this point or Amy? This would be on the radio, what is known as dead air, dead air. So I think that we are, unless I hear something from, uh, from Harry, well, I've got a message from Harry. You wrap up, Brad, so I've got that. I want to reiterate, thank you to everybody for, for tuning in as well. Um, great to have these discussions. I just love it when Silicon Flatirons is engaged um, in, uh, in smart discussions where you, you listen for a couple hours and there's five, six things that you're going to find yourself thinking about next week and next month, and I, I really feel like this is delivered. Uh, special thanks to Professor Cerdin for organizing this, as well as the entire Silicon Flatirons team for making it happen. Be well, everybody, and thanks again.